and Lonely Place with Matt Pinfield. Today's guest, Robert DeLong. Welcome to In a Lonely Place. I'm Matt Pinfield. And remember, you're never in a lonely place if you've got music in your life. Uh, or it makes it a little easier. It makes it a lot better. You know, we named this show after that Humphrey Bogart movie from the 1950s, a New Order song and a Smithereen song. I just thought it was perfect when I was locked up in my apartment on lockdown uh, when the pandemic started. Well, you know, the pandemic's still going on, but uh, we've been having a great time doing this show. And I'm very excited about our guest that we have this week uh, because I became a huge fan of his when I heard his first single, Global Concepts. I, I just thought the song was had so much life in it, and it was it was just the way I saw and loved dance music. I thought how alternative dance music should be, and uh, I've been a fan ever since. So I'm really happy to have him join us on the show. And my guest today is Robert DeLong. Robert, good to see you, man. How you doing? Amazing. Good to see you. Yeah, you know, it's Robert, it's amazing. I think back, I can't believe it's probably now been, we first met maybe seven, eight years ago. Um, I saw you playing, uh, you you were playing at the Fire, not Firefly Festival, not, so people don't think it's like the Fire Festival, they don't, right. it's fire, <laughs> not, that, not that disaster, but um, Firefly is a thing in Maryland that they do, you know, like, or Delaware, it's somewhere down there. Delaware, yeah, yeah, uh, that would have been 2013, yeah, crazy. Yeah. And it was great. And I interviewed you there for like uh, for some TV stuff. And it was really cool. We had met for the first time. And I remember I originally thinking that you were from that area of like like D.C. Or, <laughs> but then finding out you're from Washington State, you know, which was which is cool. So because there's always been so much great music from the uh, Pacific Northwest. Hey, so so, Robert, tell me about, you know, I know that you, you know, you studied as a, to be a drummer and you you were drumming in a bunch of like independent bands when you were starting out. But when you were a kid, what was the first music that you found interest in? What were the things like, what was the thing that drove you first to know that music was how you wanted to spend your time and be creative? Yeah, I mean, I think I was introduced to music via my dad. Uh, my dad was a drummer and that's kind of where I picked up drums. I had his old Ludwig uh, kit laying around the house and uh, he listened to a lot of like, uh, like Pat Metheny and like uh, a bunch of like fusion records, but also like he was listening to like ELP and yes. And uh, so that was kind of my like first foray into music. Uh, but I kind of grew up in like uh, a Christian household. So there was a lot of that CCM floating around from the early nineties. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, like DC talk and jar of cl jars of clay and yeah, for sure. All that stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't until I was in probably my early teens that I kind of found my own music, which was, Initially, a lot of that, like, kind of pop punk, skate punk stuff, which, you know, quickly led to newer and weirder things than that. But, uh, yeah, so I th that's where I started, though, I guess. That's great. I mean, that was cool. So, I mean, wh when did you start playing in your first band at that point? Were you were you a young teen? Were you, like, 15, 16 when you started uh, playing with bands locally in, in, uh, in Washington? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we started our first band. Uh, I think they're called No Leaf Clover at the age of 13. Um, yeah. Uh, and I was singing and drumming in the back. Um, and uh, we were terrible, but it was fun. We, you know, we were making uh, crappy punk music. So, but being terrible, you have to start by being terrible. That's like everybody. <laughs> I, I love that Dave Grohl I had said that at the Grammys one year when he was kind of denouncing the whole idea of singer competitions and people telling you you're no good and he said you know what you're supposed to suck start a band in your garage and you know what i mean and you suck at first and you get better and you just keep practicing and i thought that was a cool thing because it's the truth you know everybody's got to start somewhere absolutely right? yeah and i think that you know so much of part of that is like when you're a kid just getting in front of people and playing music is like uh you know it's exhilarating and terrifying and and i don't know that's something that i've carried forward my whole life so yeah that's amazing. So what was those, what were those like? Did you do like neighborhood basement shows? I mean, because when you're underage, that's how a lot of bands started out back in, the, in that day. And even in my, you know, I like, te you know, when I was in bands, when I was when I was growing up, it was the teen center. It was the junior high dances. It was like whatever, you know, anybody that would have you. Right. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, it was uh, I mean, up through high school, it was like playing the teen centers around town and um you know there'd be like weird community outdoor shows and then you know somebody would have a show in their backyard uh definitely like the teen centers were funny because they were both doing you know uh us high school junior high like shitty bands but then also like they were like um 
you know, they'd have like at the drive in there in the early days and stuff too. So it was, you know, kind of a weird mix. That's very cool. I can yeah. I mean, only really imagine, and you know, having really cool independent bands like them, you know what I mean? Like, it's, that's, that's an, when you're a kid and you go see that because they were pretty nihilistic live when they played. They were great. You know? Oh, yeah. It's like them and the Blood Brothers and a lot of that kind of like grindcore stuff happening in Seattle at the time, too. So, yeah, that yeah. was a blast, certainly. Yeah, it was great that you got to witness that as a kid, too, which is cool. So then you went to college. When you went to college, you, you continued to study music, right? Yeah, so I went to college. I, uh, you know, I got a degree in uh, commercial music with an emphasis in audio engineering. But my um, performance instrument, of course, was drums. And honestly, that's probably where I devoted most of my time in college was drumming just like between playing in jazz band playing for you know a little like jazz combos playing in my like indie rock band and then whoever would you know pay me or pay me in beer you know <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. um yeah and and but then all the while i was just producing you know uh either bands i was in or just my own music um and you know i was just living and breathing music and i you know, I, I nothing's changed really it's still the same now um but yeah, it was it was great. It was a great time to kind of cut your teeth and having access to all those resources in college is huge. Like just being able to take over a studio for a night, you know, and like, I don't know how to use this microphone. Let's figure it out. You know, that must have been cool. I mean, that's the, the thing about making that jump from high school is uh, when you do when they do have programs like that where you can where you like you said, you have equipment. So did you kind of hone your craft that way, like experimenting in there and figuring out how different things worked when like where when you started learning you know, audio engineering, I mean, you, you basically were practicing with local artists, right? And and it was uh, producing local local bands, I'm sure, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I uh, By the end of high school, I kind of had started getting into electronic music. So I was like producing on my computer at home, you know, in like Fruity Loops or whatever, like yeah. making these kind of weird uh, little electronic hybrid tracks that were like bad postal servers or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it was college that I really dug into the audio engineering thing. And it was just by playing in bands, honestly. And we just had to figure out how to record them. And, you know, we were in the, you know, kind of more, uh, I'd say, non-traditional kind of experimental indie stuff. So we were trying to emulate that as best we could. But of course, it was, uh, you know, you're, you're learning. <laughs> so, yeah, you go along, a lot right? of failed, failed experiments. But that's the whole point. So I mean, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's all trial and error. But that's the beauty of it, too. And as, uh, you know, happy accidents and good things that, that, that come about from that, right? For sure, yeah. So one of the great things was I remember there was a, a you know, a music and radio convention that was taking place. And I think Carlsbad or Palm Springs. It was, no, it was probably Carlsbad, California. And this was the second time that I had seen you. But I got to introduce you on stage for a bunch of radio programmers. That's right. And I, and I loved just that you blew everybody there away because I love the whole one man show that you were doing. And, and so tell me, was that something that you started doing out of necessity or and something you found, th found that was really interesting? You're like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this stuff on my own. I, I, I always love that. And, you know, again, the drums were very dominant, which I thought was one of the cool things too, because you could actually play who you weren't just, you know what I mean? There was a right. lot going on. Yeah, I mean, the one-man show really came out of... Um, I was playing in so many bands, and I was kind of just sick of the whole, like, process of wrangling a bunch of people together and, and and trying to, you know, get people to learn parts, and I didn't have any money to pay people. And, you know, it was also, like... I'm a, I'm a really obsessive person. When I get stuck on something, I hyper-focus, and I just go all the way. And so, you know, I was just... I don't know. I was just trying to figure out how am I going to do this these songs that I've been writing. And this is back in probably 2007, 2008, so, like, very end of college for me. Um, and yeah, I just like, we kind of just, uh, put myself in our garage studio and just work on this stuff all night. Um, and eventually, it, you know, it kind of came out to be something unique, um, that was so, you know, just unique to me, like, so my thing. Uh, and so when I started playing out, I didn't really realize what I was doing, but when I started playing out, it was like immediately people were like, I've never seen anything like this before, especially yeah. at a coffee shop in Glendora or something. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're used uh, to the singer songwriter, like doing a Joni Mitchell cover or something, right? Or, right. You know, that's amazing. So yeah, I love that you would take that and, and, and do it in a place like that. I mean, that, it was the cool thing. It, it was that DIY vibe of doing it, but it still had so much energy and passion in it. I, which I thought was so cool. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, you know, that's something I've always thought, first of all, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know when I get into performance mode, I'm like, really, I'm just feeling it, you know? Um, but then also the, like, as a drummer, 
I've always approached live performance from that. Like it's a physical thing. It's very physical. Every movement is uh, communicating something energetically. Um, and I think that to me is like what I, I tried to like translate into electronic music, which is just something you just don't see much in electronic music, frankly, you know, cause it's like technical people are turning knobs slowly. It's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And, and it's, that's why it was such a breath of fresh air when I saw you play live, because you were, you, you, you I mean, you, it had every aspect that was to me important. It had, it had the rhythm and it, it had musicality, but it had the performance energy and it had cool lyrics and melody as well. So, you know, all those things going on. And I think, uh, I think your love of a lot of indie stuff that you grew up on probably also, you know, helped in, in that way, informing you, you know what I mean? To, in your writing style, right? Totally. I mean, yeah, I, you know, yeah. I mean, I guess like everyone, I, I went through a lot of phases of like things I was into, uh, but something that really stuck with me was a lot of those Seattle singer songwriters like Dave Bazan, um, you know, who's like just really super focused on lyrics uh, in the same way, like, a lot of the early uh, like Death Cab for Cutie stuff was, you know, where it was like really about it's sort of like talking about big ideas a lot of times, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I think maybe maybe that's a like an outgrowth of also growing up in the church or something like having that like you're always singing about something important, something existential, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you remember the first show you saw live? Did you actually go to see any of those um, contemporary Christian artists back in the day? No, you know, I, I feel lucky I didn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, No, I, actually, the, the first show I saw live was I asked my dad to take me to go see Pat Metheny on my, like, 12th birthday. So, wow. yeah. yeah, we saw Pat Metheny at the Key Arena in Seattle. And, uh, you know, I, I was a kid. I'd never seen a big concert before, and I was just blown away. Because, I mean, like, of course, he was, like, touring with, like, just some sick musicians. Um, and it was a, you know, honestly, that was, like, one of the first times I was like, wow, there's, like... Uh, Look at all these people that paid money to be here. Like this, this is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, right. And you know, I remember seeing him on that American Garage tour when I was younger. You know what I mean? And oh yeah, it's, uh, yeah. That was and what a great record that was too. You know, so it's uh that's cool. So your dad, I mean, you got that from your dad. He was into Prague and he was definitely into jazz. You know what I mean? Which was, which was cool. I, I gotta talk to you about. So so when did you feel like you people really discovered you? Because your first single. Global Concepts is still one of my favorite songs of uh, of last decade. I mean, I just love that track. I uh, was blown away by it. I, was, I didn't know what to expect when I, when I first put it on. And I went, well, this is what dance music is, it should be. <laughs> because it had an attitude. But it, but, it, but it was rhythmic and it was just, and I really appreciated that. It wasn't boring. It, it had so much, you know, it just had edge to it. Um, talk to me about how you ended up getting discovered and, and the making of your, and the first single getting released, kind of take me on that, on that journey. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I was, I was, like I said, just like playing shit gigs around town and, uh, I just had some good friends that were really, uh, you know, kind of behind what I was doing. Uh, most notably my friend, Matt Starcher, who later became my sound guy and touring manager. Uh, and he really just helped me like set up some shows um like and we ended up throwing this like diy like kind of warehouse show um this is like 2010 2011 maybe uh and we just got some good video footage of it and um you know i got a bunch of friends out there it's a, just a great party a and that was like you know that i got in the hands of some people like who kind of like started kind of managing me and then started doing a uh residency here at los globos in silver lake i don't know if you've been to that place but you know it's a it's a it's a funky uh dive of a <laughs> of a club yeah. uh but yeah i did a monday night residency there and it was just like i had good friends uh they just came out every week and brought the party and that vibe and that energy we fed off of each other and it created something that felt very exciting and you know uh uh brendan burke uh, who you know uh manager saw me and invited uh Daniel Glass, who is, you know, uh, Glass Note and a few other record labels. Uh, Mark from the label came out and he saw me and it was just kind of like there, you know, uh, we had a conversation after that. And six months later, I was signed and uh, six months or three or four months after that, you know, I was uh, like MTV wants to watch and all that kind of stuff. So it was a pretty quick once it happened, it, it went like that. Um, I went from playing, you know, for maximum uh 100 friends to like suddenly playing like Pearl Palooza in front of a thousand people. And yeah, that's it was a lot. It was great. I mean, yeah, best craziest year of my life for sure. 
It, it's amazing too. Yeah. And you know, Brendan's great. Brendan is, uh, you know, he's my hiking partner, you know, he and I go hiking all right. the time and he's the best, you know, um, and you know, I've known him for a long time and of course, Daniel Glass as well. And they had worked together back in the Chrysalis Records days. So right. everybody just kind of knows each other throughout, you know, that period. But I, I just remember how excited Daniel was when, uh, when uh, you know, he signed you as well, when they signed you over at Glass Note. But it was so cool because the the idea of of a single like Global Concepts where it's like, you know, it's just, it had that attitude. I'm just going to, you know, make you fucking dance. And I, and I love that. <laughs> just thought it was, it was cool. I hadn't heard a record that had that kind of power and a dance record in a, in a while. And it made me really happy. I mean, to, to hear something like that. And then, you know, of course, then it was the first full length album too. Right. So, I mean, you know, at that period of time with just movement, when you went from being signed out. So tell me how long did it take you to record just movement? And, and where did, did you end up doing that uh, in Los Angeles? Cause you were living there at the time. Had yeah. I mean, that? just movement was like, uh... I think at that I'd released uh, different versions of just movement on my own at shows uh, with different names, like where we're going and whatever for the last like three years. So like all that material had been long written. Um, there was maybe one song that was written closer to the record, but um, yeah, so it was like already done. And I basically brought it to glass note and then was like, all right, let's make it better. But this is, these are the songs, this is the record. So we just, uh, I went into the studio with this guy, Patrick Mundy, and we, uh, we mixed the record at, uh, at this spot. Oh God, somewhere in the Valley. Um, yeah, you know, 17 days of just like hunkered down mixing this record and that's what it was. And it was great. You know, it was a labor of love and, and I feel I'm really excited in retrospect to think about like, yeah, I, I like, we really did that all on my own for the most part. Like I had a lot of help from people, but it was really just like, that was it. You know, as my first debut record, it felt good to be something that was singularly me you know uh um, yeah totally absolutely and it and it seriously was and then you know once a long way down ep came out i mean that that song broke through in a huge way it was like a number three alternative record and in some stations it was the number one record and it was uh it did really well were you were you really excited and was when you found that people were, were discovering the band and loving that song was that was that a, a really pleasant surprise to you or did you did you kind of know that you'd had something really special. <laughs> uh, you know, that's such a funny, I mean, th- this is classic me. Like I, I, I get stuck on like, I love weird things. I love the left to center stuff. Uh, long way down, wrote that song. And I was kind of like, that's cool, whatever. Uh, and then it was Brendan actually. He was like, no, that one's good. You got to like, let's finish that one and make it great. Uh, and so we, you know, we did, and then we put it out and, you know, it was a slow burn at radio, but it just kept growing over the course of like six months. Um, so it was like that kind of like, oh, wow, this is cool. It's doing better. Oh, wow, it's doing great. Oh, shoot, like we're in the top five. That's insane. Um, but it it was because it was kind of a slow ascent. It wasn't that immediate like, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> let's yeah. uh, pop a bottle of champagne. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it was uh, it was amazing. And that opened a lot of doors. And, and, and certainly, you know, it's so funny because radio is like such a weird thing. Uh, you know, it was suddenly like places like Buffalo, I had fans and places like Houston, I had fans where I never would have before, you know? Uh, yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been a blast. I mean, just all of a sudden when that, all that started happening and, uh, you know, and touring on that EP. Now, how much time was it in between that when you started working on the stuff for In the Cards? And what was different about that process in making that second record? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I guess I was always kind of just working, basically since releasing Just Movement, I was always like toying around with ideas uh, of what would be the next record. But it was probably 2000, beginning of 2014 that I really started digging into to writing for In the Cards. And, you know, that was a crazy year. I mean, 2013, 2014 were both years where I did, you know, probably upwards of 200 shows a year. That was just constantly on the road. So there wasn't a lot of time. So it's like anytime I was home, it was like, all right. I'm going in my studio and I'm writing something <laughs> uh, yeah. or I'm, you know, I'm doing a writing session. Um, yeah. And, and that was the first time that I wrote collaboratively, collaboratively with other people. And, and, and that was like a, at first it was like, I had to put my own ego on the shelf a little bit, you know, trying to figure out how to meet people in the middle. But then once I got into it, it's like, Oh, this is great. People can see what's great about what I do, but also can be like, that thing's not so great. And in retrospect, I'm always like, you were right, you know? Um, and that's great to have that kind of perspective and that, that that process can be really rewarding and fun. So like about half that record I wrote with other people and then, uh, you know, 
yeah. And it was, but it was, it was all over the place. Like I'd be in Australia, I'd come home straight into a writing session, you know, and then, uh, you know, leave the next day and I'd be like producing on the airplane. Um, and, uh, it was insanity to be perfectly honest. And, uh, I, yeah, I would, I would not recommend that as a writing process though. I, you know, it worked out. I like the record. <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely great. So then with doing that, see you in the future EP, it was great. Kate Flay. I love that you, you did a collaboration with her, Robert, because she is just such a cool artist. I love, you know, I, I remember meeting her the first time up in uh, San Francisco cause she's from the Bay as well. And I happened to be living there doing radio at the time. And, uh, I just thought that she was she was she just had so much good edge to her, but there were a lot of layers to what she did. How did that collaboration take place? Did you guys become friends, maybe playing together on tour? Did you meet on the road? Did someone suggest you guys work together? What was it? Yeah, it was kind of actually kind of all three. Uh, we yeah. met in must have been 2014, 2015, maybe at uh, Live 105 uh, or like the BFT, you know, the the thing that happens at. Um, the uh, amphitheater up there uh yeah. in the bay and uh yeah we you know we just met backstage and we we're just shooting the shit and uh you know she seemed very cool uh and then later i kind of like started digging into her music especially 2000 i guess it would have been like 16 17 when that next record came out and i was just like man it's like so cool it's like rock for sure you know alternative uh with like you know uh, she's doing the rap thing but it's all so introspective and clever you know uh lyrically and that was something that really like attracted uh I, like piqued my interest i guess and um so yeah we just like set up like a a, a copy date and hung out and kind of got to know each other a little bit um and then we ended up living like blocks from each other so we just would you know we just hang out every once in a while and then uh you know uh time went on uh you know one time i was just like yeah do you want to just like get together and write a tune she's like yeah let's do it um and it was great. I mean, it was just like such an ease. It was about the easiest song I've ever written. Like we were just like in the studio. Uh, just uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know how to describe it. It's like, you know, just the, the lyrics were just coming out immediately. The the ideas were just coming out immediately. Like three hours later, we're like, all right, we did it. <laughs> um, I mean, it is a great song. I can't believe you, did, you guys wrote it in that short period of time. Favorite colors below. It's great. You know? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, but that was, that was, great. I mean, I, I, I love her. She's so amazing. And, uh, we've written together a bit of times since then, uh, both for her and me. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, I'll have an, a song that I wrote with her coming out soon. So yeah, cool stuff. Will it be on your, your uh, next record or will it be on hers or is it? Uh, no, it's for me. It's uh, one of my tunes. Um, yeah, she's not singing on it or anything, but just like, you know, uh, she, I think she, I think we both kind of have a, a, a mutual connection of like kind of understanding each other's brains a little bit, uh, even though we're very different people. Uh, I think she can like kind of see me from a mile away and <laughs> help me express some of those things that I sometimes uh, struggle to spit out. But yeah. Cool when you have somebody who's amused like that that you can work with, you know what I mean? In that totally. Way. You know, which which is great. So when you did a See You in the Future EP, that was, uh, you know, it was, it was very cool. And there were, you know, I mean, I things like, you know, first person on earth, you know, coming out of that. I mean, I just, uh, tell me about, you know, that, tell me, let, let's talk about that. Cause I always wanted to talk to you about that song. Yeah. Well, um, that was an interesting one. Like, uh, I actually got together with, uh, Ricky Reed. We were, had a writing session together and, uh, just like sitting in the room and he's like, what do you want to write about? And I was like, oh, I want to write about the end of the world. And he's like, well, that's, that's not like a pop song exactly. And I was like, I know. And then he's like, uh, would you ever write love songs? It's like, never. I never write love songs. He's like, well, let's write a love song. And I was like, about the end of the world. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of, you know, and that was the genesis of it. But I mean, like really, you know, uh, yeah, I, it was interesting. Um, it was kind of like using a, a, a long-term relationship as sort of a, a, a metaphor for maybe like something even more, I don't know, uh, existential. But yeah, I it, that was like a, that one, I don't know. It, it, it just, it, the track kind of came together really quick and it was just like, this one just feels special and different. Um, but not in a way that I feel like it's like saccharine or too overly sentimental or something. Um, yeah, yeah. You're kind of, you're careful not to do that. Right. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a thing that you want to make sure you don't go in that territory. Right. Yeah. I think it's just cause it's not my personality, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, cause I love sentimental stuff. Like I listen to like Phoebe Bridgers all the time, you know, but she's it's like kind of a local, uh, you know, right out here in LA. Right. Oh yeah. She's great. I always see her walking around the reservoir actually when I'm running. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you uh, great. It's cool. When you run into people like that and you're, you know, that, you know, 
Yeah. She, I love her albums. She's been great. She's killing it, you know? Yeah, I mean, another, you know, another just like lyrical, uh, I, I don't know, savant, like above, like beyond her years, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't believe she's that young. It's crazy. Talk about Revolutionary, too, on, on the EP. For me. Sure, yeah. I mean, Revolutionary was, um, you know, another song that was just... I mean, that was that was pretty fresh after uh, the 2016 election that I wrote that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a lot on our minds, you know. But, I mean, Revolutionary, more than anything, was, like, really just, like, you know, kind of dealing with this, like, insane uh, social media culture. Um, just things that were brewing in my mind. It's like, man, technology is so amazing, and there's so many great things that come out of it. Like, we can have a conversation like this together, uh, you know, worlds apart. Um, but then... Obviously, the downfalls are obvious uh, yeah. at this point or like, you know, and some of them were more subtle than others. But yeah, I mean, that was really it. I was just like thinking about those things and um, yeah, wrote the tune. And, and, and you know, that one's funny. It's a, it's a bit more um, maybe epic and anthemic than anything that I've really written before or since. Uh, but it felt like it kind of fit the subject matter and the yeah. I, and, and certainly uh, I will say, uh, you know, I got to get my like uh g-funk like sign lead uh <laughs> going yeah. on the intro and the outro which yeah. uh, i've always wanted to sneak something like that in the tune so that's fun from a musical standpoint that's cool that's great absolutely hey so, so how has it been for you like when you first got locked down in the pandemic robert were you literally were you take at that point uh starting to write or were you going to be hitting the road what were you thinking of doing at that point you know, actually, I had had a uh, there was a month long tour that I was going to go on as a drummer and MD. Uh, I don't know if you know Ali X. Uh, yeah. She just, yeah. Um, yeah. We're friends. And like my my tour manager, sound guy was doing it. And like uh, my good friend, Gothic Tropics playing bass. So it was just like we yeah, it was going to be like a fun, like cool tour. And, uh, you know, honestly, getting to play just drums and like just do the tech stuff. That's super fun as somebody who always has the pressure of doing everything <laughs> you yeah know? and you literally do everything i mean you know right uh, yeah so i was super pumped for that and the, that was uh tour was supposed to start march 17th as you know that was the day we all locked down so <laughs> uh were you like literally already were you already were you home or were you already somewhere where you're on the road no we were at home we were doing rehearsals in my studio like and like every day it was like uh is this gonna happen and they're like probably not it's not gonna happen okay yeah. um but yeah, so then right at the beginning, um, I really, I guess, kind of dug into writing music, but I found initially that sort of like both the anxiety of the initial pandemic kind of thing happening and the, I don't know, like I, I, I just felt like I wasn't inspired, like nothing was happening. Every day was the same, you know? Um, yeah. So I, it was really hard for me to kind of dig into writing and it wasn't really until five months into the pandemic that I felt like everything kind of started to coagulate uh, and make sense. Like it, it coalesced into something that, that it started to be like, all right, no songs are coming out. The productions are like getting tighter. And I will say that like, that is something that during this pandemic, I've really dug even more into like just building my sonic palette uh, in a much more bulletproof way than I ever have before. And it makes me feel a lot more autonomous, which is great. Like, I feel like I can get productions like so much closer on my own without looking for outside help. Uh, just because I've spent hours and hours and hours here in the studio <laughs> yeah, banging away. Getting, and, you know, and coming up with, with more ideas and, and finding out other ways to make sound and, you know, and, and to create. That's great. So, so for, did you find it in, during any part of that time during lockdown? I mean, uh, did did you get did you get like some people we, we talk about it sometimes you know we went through different emotions. There's a whole flow of different emotions. Sometimes we get we would get down, we get angry, or some you know I mean depending on what it was. How about for you? Was it was it something that you with the uncertainty? Were you okay with that at that period of time? Or did, yeah. And did you try to turn the news off and kind of get away from a lot of the insanity? Yeah, I would say by like May, I had started to like my anxiety. You know, I'm not a super anxious person, but it definitely like I was at the height of my anxiety. And I'd say even like a little bit depressed, like I was definitely like not feeling good. I, it was like just sort of a malaise, just like, I don't know, kind of stuck in my own head. Um, and yeah, actually, a, a big thing was I, I went with my uh, my housemate out to the desert. And it was just like it was like during the height of like, you know, no one's going anywhere. No one's seeing anybody. 
Uh, so we just went out to the desert and like spent a couple days in Joshua Tree. And it was just like, oh, my God, like just such a reset. And then I really did come back. That was like beginning of June and just like full throttle. Um, and as you know, that was also crazy time uh, with all the protests going on here in Los Angeles. And we live by the highway. So it was just like five or six helicopters over us at all times. Yeah. It was insanity. Like, uh, yeah, it was a strange time. But I, I definitely feel like it, it, it was like it was kind of dark times at first. But then kind of overcoming that, I feel like so much. I don't know. I feel great now. I feel like so much more focused, uh, happy. I feel more energetic than I have in years, to be honest. Like, yeah. So it's kind of a weird, it's weird how you have to like go through that kind of slump to get to the other side. Um, and now I don't, yeah, I don't even know what's going on. No one knows what's going on anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, but it's funny. It's the same thing for me. I mean, I can relate to that where I was, I was definitely angry down, confused about what was happening. And, and I went through a little rough, a rough patch, but I'm feeling great too. So I think it's great to see people come out of the other side and with, with just some positivity and get something good out of it, which is to learn something from it. You know what I mean? And 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 take it in a creative direction, which is great. You know. For so sure. I want to talk to you about the latest single because I think it's very cool you working with Ash because Ash, of course, you know she had a, a huge hit um, recently with that moral of the story. She you know worked with Phineas, of course, you know over. Right. Uh, you know, Billy Ives, his brother. And um, and the record, I mean, I, I know at least in, in Los Angeles, like with Alt-97, the station there, and I, I, that song had exploded right out of a box for, for her. And, um, you know, and so, and then it kind of uh, took on its own life with pop. But, um, and she's a very young artist. I mean, I was, I remember uh, my friend was working on that record, working that record, and she was so excited the first time she heard it on the radio. There was footage of her hearing it on the radio in the car. Yeah. And I hear she's a great, great young lady. So tell me a bit about working with her and how that collaboration uh, manifested. How did it happen? Sure. Yeah. So that was about uh, it's a bit over a year ago, maybe almost a year and a half ago now that we uh, we had kind of like encountered each other. I just, you know, shows, whatever. Um, I went to one of her shows. I forget who she was opening for, but it was at I think it was at the Fonda. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, we just like kind of like went backstage and said hi and connected and then realized that we had uh, some mutual friends, which of course you do. Uh, everyone always does in the music industry, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, set up a writing session for honestly, like the next week, um, had two days together at my studio. Uh, and the timing was very specific because it was like, I, I was I, literally in the process of breaking up with my 10 year relationship. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, my girlfriend at the time was moving out um, in the middle of us doing this writing session. And, you know, I, Ash had gone through a divorce a couple of years before. So we had like a lot of like shared experiences to kind of muse over. And I was in the thick of it, you know. Um, yeah, coming off a 10 year relationship is intense. I can only. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, it's, you know, it's a divorce. Like, <laughs> yeah, no yeah. matter what, open or not, that's still a divorce. I mean, I know from my long term relationships, and I've been divorced. So I know, man. I, I can I, I totally get it. So my 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 heart's with you on that, you know. And that's a real uh, period of change. You go through so many emotions, right? For sure. Yeah. No, it was a lot. Um. Yeah. I mean, I was a chaos person for a couple months after that. But I will say that uh, it was a good. We I, I don't know. We were able to kind of distill and capture that emotion and and use it in two different. We wrote two songs together. Uh, the other one will come out uh, sometime later on an album. Um. Uh. And. The other one's more like specifically addressing that kind of thing. This was kind of almost a playful musing on uh, better in college be, uh, on, on, you know, just like how people change over time and how your image of somebody. I mean, in, in my case was like, you know, somebody that we literally got in a relationship like days after college, in a sense. Um, and how, you know, I mean, in what by the time you're 30 something. You have changed. <laughs> and so much. I mean, every year, right? I mean, yeah. it, in those years, you know, I mean, more than any. I mean, I right. guess you continue to evolve as a human being. If you, you, you would, you want to believe that definitely. And I, you know, I see changes through the years, but those years especially, right? Coming out like 21, 22 from college, and then you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's just like, yeah, you you evolve as a human being. You know, you think you know so much when you're so young. I know I did. I thought, I did. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, like, what? I, I look back and I go. I didn't shit you know what i mean or like it, I it, that was it but i mean there were a lot of things about life lessons i needed to learn you know what i mean and you know you uh you, you just your perspectives change and grow so i guess 
the better in college. So that's kind of the reflection on that, right? That same kind of thing and change. In really- yeah, yeah, a bit. Yeah. And then, you know, it was also, you know, obviously we had like a lot of in- uh, experiences in common. But we also had a couple friends in common, uh, most notably a friend of hers from college who she had had a crush on. Uh, and he was like, a, you know, a good friend of mine. And um, so we kind of used that as like the central theme and just kind of follow the, uh, you know, the the rabbit trail, wherever it led us. And uh, it was great. I mean, she is like, first of all, she's a, she's a great songwriter. She really is. Uh, and she's got such a beautiful, like, voice that's kind of perfect for what she does and it was honestly just like the same kind of thing as like writing with kayfa in a completely different avenue but very honest right like a very yeah. like up lyrically right yeah yeah and and you know both of us were able to connect on that and then you know it's a lot of fun doing like a duet with somebody who has like a beautiful voice so it's like i get to just i get to be me in my like normal range you know i don't have to like try to capture all the energy she can she can kind of cover some of that yeah. uh yeah. which is great yeah um yeah because obviously like that's the uh she's like honestly the antithesis to k flay vocally right <laughs> Whereas, yeah it's a different thing right exactly right? yeah uh which was fun yeah but yeah she was great to work with uh, a blast and uh you know uh i mean so happy for her that that moral of the story just kind of blew up i mean of course it would it was it was it was kind of a perfect song, you know, it's like one of those like perfectly distilled things. Yeah, it was. And you couldn't like, you couldn't ignore the lyric and the message and, you know, people went, went, went through that. So many people have gone through that in a relationship, you know what I mean? And sure. so, and she was writing autobiographically there. So, I mean, that was the thing, you know, which right. was cool. And, you know, I want to talk about some of your favorite albums. Cause you know, what we do here on the show, Robert is we love to talk about things that have influenced you and, and records that are really important in your life. And um, the list that you gave is great, and it's really diverse, and I love that. So let's talk about uh, the Talking Heads because I love this record. It was their fourth album, "A Remain in Light." Uh, what an incredible record this was! You know, things like "Cross-eyed and Painless" and "Once in a Lifetime." Of course, people know, but it's just uh, such a strong and cool record. Tell me why it's important to you. I mean, first of all, I'm I'm just like uh, I'm a huge. Uh, david byrne fan and i'm a huge brian eno fan uh you know and brian eno produced this record and it was just like this one to me from the first moment like that first hit at the beginning of uh born under punches like it just like it it it, it captures you and it takes you on this ride and it's it's cool too because it's so i mean it's most of it's so kind of dancey you know in a way but yeah. they do that thing of being like it's dancey it's very like intellectual and uh, a bit like absurdist and uh, strange, which I love anything that's like strange and takes you on a ride. But then also weirdly, it, 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 it has this sort of like emotive quality to it as well, even though it feels like you're kind of distant from it. Like, um, I mean, obviously once in a lifetime is like maybe the most immediately relatable lyric or something. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, really, it was like the Born Under Punches, The Heat Goes On was that that from that first moment, I was like, that is this is so cool. And I think the first time I really gave this record a listen was when I was in college. Um, and it really has influenced the way I think about writing. Certainly, I don't know, aspects of, of dancey stuff and groovy stuff. As a drummer, it's always fun to hear these cool kind of like African influenced rhythms over this kind of punk uh like reimagining of it you yeah know? i don't know it's a great record it it really is i love it um now the next record that you picked was pink floyd's dark side of the moon which is yeah, of course it's an epic record and one of the most famous concept albums ever right right and you know and 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 just what for a lot of people ground zero when they got into electronic music because it was one of the first records that reached that many people uh, right when it, so tell me why it's so uh, important to you. Is this something that you uh, that, that your dad played too, uh, and that you your your parents were were familiar with and fans of? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my dad introduced me to to Pink Floyd with uh, Dark Side of the Moon, and then like Umma Gumma. <laughs> Go back, uh, going backwards into somewhere. somewhere yeah, yeah, yeah. Dark Side of the Moon is where my dad stopped with Pink Floyd. He's like everything after that was too mainstream. <laughs> yeah, Adam Hart Mother and stuff like that. And yeah, yeah, even metal. Exactly by clouds all that stuff right you know? yeah yeah um so yeah i mean this one just to me was like you know i dug into this record when i was in high school and it was just so obvious the reasons that it was important because you hear the musical heritage in it 
uh, you yeah. know, in hindsight, like all these sounds uh, are things that wouldn't have happened if this record didn't kind of set the precedent for that and bring it to, you know, I think this is like, to me, my favorite Floyd record because it does, it has the conceptiness that Floyd has, but it does it in a way that's less pretentious, I think, than some of the later iterations um, where it's also like, it's just good songs and cool. Like it's another, I, I love anything. I, I, I think this whole list of records, it's like everything is a ride, like from start to finish. Right. Yeah. And this record is such a ride. I mean, it's like, um, it just doesn't stop. And, you know, I mean like such cool things like on the run, which is just, mm -hmm. I mean, essentially it's just like electronic noodling, but it's like kind of cruising and like with yeah. all this weird art stuff going on. I mean, like, yeah, I don't know this record. And then lyrically it's, I mean, it's it's quite some of it's quite profound or like it's, you know, it's very. I don't know, it's like astute musings on like existential concepts, you know, and, and you know, in a very like kind of like their early 20s, like stoned armchair way. But yeah, I, I love it. <laughs> great. It is true. There's some this. I mean, the songs are great on that record. Now, you picked a uh, third, the Beatles, Sergeant Peppers. And, uh, you know, what a record, of course. I mean, it's yeah. the original. One of the original, certainly one of the original concept albums, if not the the first one that you know people really grab a hold of and inspired so many other people, right? I mean, you know, that and Pet Sounds. So, tell me about uh, your love for this record. I mean, this one for me was like, you know, I, I, it's kind of funny. It's like uh, Dark Side of the Moon and Sgt. Pepper's are like the most obvious kind of records in a way, but but I think they really do kind of fit my personality uh, in the sense that again, I love anything that's like kind of psychedelic and concepty and takes you on a ride but then also has great songs and, and you know obviously the beatles like uh, they wrote four bad songs maybe you know yeah, <laughs> it's like you know every, yeah. so, every song is a fucking banger and and it's even if it's like corny and cheesy they always like twist it in a way that's like fun and 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 cool or psychedelic or a little like tongue-in-cheek and and i mean my favorite beatles song and one of my favorite songs of all time is a day in the life because it's such an epic adventure, it really like you lose yourself in the ride and you kind of forget what happened before once it goes through that like uh, maniacal swell, uh, you know, and then like pops in with the piano, like woke up uh, like that. I don't know. That song to me, I mean, I end every uh, every single one of my headlining shows with the sound at the end of that record. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you made it, it's the last chord, the, the last, the, the long chord. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's, so I don't know. I mean, I this one to me is like kind of obvious and on the nose, but it's just great. I mean, it, and if, if there's a kid out there that hasn't heard this record, go listen to it now. I mean, <laughs> it's one of the great, it really is. Like you said, there's very few things the Beatles did that weren't good. I mean, like maybe a cover of one of my least favorite thing is the cover of Mr. Moonlight. I mean, it's just a terrible, you know, it's like that. Yeah, yeah. They, they probably had. We got to write, you know, at that period, they didn't make three albums a year and a bunch of singles. So they're probably like, what do we know from our Hamburg days? Oh, that song, Mr. Moonlight. Ah, we'll, we'll throw that together. <laughs> you know, doesn't stand up to any of the other stuff they did. I mean, a lot of the covers they did, they did amazing versions of. But anyway, sure. that's, I'm glad you picked that. Now, what I love uh, that I think a lot of people may or may not know that are that are watching us is that you picked an album from Boards of Canada, which is uh, this duo from Scotland. People would think they're from Canada, right? With <laughs> like that but you know like would you throw people off hey, those guys must be a couple dudes from montreal no they're actually scottish guys right Which oh yeah is, you know and this was their second album i think music has the right to children first or second i am almost positive but it it was their second it was their second record but their yeah. first album yeah this was the one that like really put them on the map and yeah yeah, I think it was 1998 and uh it was one of those records that i i literally discovered you know, back when Barnes is like pre-Spotify, of course, back when Barnes and Noble had like a little station you could go to and just find similar artists. Um, and so I just gone down this rabbit hole and this is probably 2002, maybe. Uh, yeah. And I, I discovered this record and I just kind of bought it based on the artwork, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's really cool with all the blacked out faces, right? Like I like yeah. all the like blank faces, just something about it. It's very cool. Yeah, so I, I bought this record and I didn't get it for the longest time. Um, and this was like kind of the early, like my inklings into like exploring electronic music, but still being into like, you know, punk music and also still like being into, you know, kind of more straight ahead alternative stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, but then this record just kind of stuck with me and it kept growing on me. And then like 
you know, eventually it just, I was like, this is, this record is so influential. And it, it really is like historically a quite influential record, both in like the alternative electronic world. And then also in like the, you know, all the ambient and like techno worlds. Like it, it, it it's, I, I don't know. It's one of those like seminal records in that sense. And to me, it's like, you know, for being an electronic record that there's almost no melody on, I can still sing every single one of these songs in my head. <laughs> um, I mean, it's pretty nuts, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, it's like so nostalgic too. It like captures, it like distills this like strange seventies nostalgia that I wasn't even alive for, but it still feels nostalgic listening to it now. I don't it know. It does have that kind of sunshiny weird, you know, like that vibe, like, like an Eagle in your mind. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You know, it definitely does, which is cool. It's a, it's a, it's a really cool record. I love that you discovered it there. That's kind of, it's always fun when, you know, that's what listening stations, those are, really important in those days before you had the opportunity to stream and do everything, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I wasn't like, uh, I wasn't going to like record stores a lot as a kid, but, uh, you know, I, I would go downtown to Seattle and like to, uh, Fremont. I forget what the record store was down there and, you know, just go through the CDs and just listen to, you know, just everything and, and bizarre stuff that I would never buy, which I probably now would love, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you would just like try cause it was fun. Would you get lost in there for like an hour or so and just keep, Bringing more CDs back to the listening thing, or I, I would I would have stayed there all day if it weren't for the fact that I always went with friends. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, you were probably more interested in hanging out, listening to music than they were. They were like, "Let's go, man!" Right? You know, yeah, like, yeah. Well, you know, we were probably on the way to a show at the Showbox or uh, you know El Corazon or whatever yeah. back in the day. But, right. Yeah. Cool though. Were they always cool about you? Like, did they mind how long you stayed on the listening stations? I always wonder. No, I mean, I, I was, I was definitely, uh, I was definitely low level crate digger, not like, uh, yeah. <laughs> not like, yeah, not like the serious people that spend uh, ninety percent of their time there. Um, yeah, yeah, I get it. That's cool. Though. That's funny. I do love that. Now, you picked for Radiohead of so many great albums. In Rainbows was certainly an amazing album from the band. Yeah, it's funny because you know, it's a funny choice. Obviously, uh, I think I picked it because it's. I, I'm one of those annoying Radiohead people uh, <laughs> that like likes Radiohead too much or or did at some point. You know, I was super obsessed uh, from the age of probably 17 until like 25. Like, you know, like I remember going through uh, back when there were like iTunes hacking programs you could get uh, and and like going through like uh the dorms and just downloading like everyone's bootlegs of of uh you know radiohead live shows and just like studying yeah. them and trying to find the you know new songs or whatever but anyway uh yeah i i chose this record because it came out at a time when i was like going through a lot of uh just like personal shifts um you know yeah. it was like mid college for me you know i was like changing my whole uh like theological outlook on life which is a big thing for me yeah. uh and, and, and it just kind of, yeah, it just kind of came together at the perfect time. And I will say, this record has a lot of great songs. Um, that and, it does. Yeah, and it, and it, you know, it, it, coming out of like Kid A Amnesiac, which was kind of more their super experimental stuff for the time, um, this one felt special. Like it was like the right combination of electronic and the pop writing. Right. Um, and then of course they've gone just just wild since then, which is cool yeah. in its own right. But yeah, this one to me was like the right the right thing at the right time. And then that middle song, uh, uh, um, uh, All I Need, yeah. references, uh, I love this. It's stupid Radiohead lore, but it references um, Roy G. Biv, which is uh, Boards of Canada song on Music Has the Right to Children. And it does it, it's like right at the midpoint of the record. The record's called In Rainbows. I don't know, dumb Radiohead lore. Who knows if it means anything, but I love it. No. <laughs> You know, that's how big, you know, fans were so, so into them back in those days, like you, in the meeting people's easy documentary, like I'm, I'm in that and I'm the only person in the entire movie that he likes. That's the idea of the film. Like, he's laughing with me and having a good time. So when I would meet people that didn't have any references, knew me from, you know, like musicians that came over from England because I was on TV in America, they'd go, oh, you're the, you're the only, you were the guy in meeting people's easy, the only guy that everyone likes, <laughs> which was pretty funny. And we oh, that's incredible. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You know, I, I watched that actually a bunch of times. That's so funny. I didn't. Uh, yeah, I've never made that connection until now. Well, yeah, that was it. It was funny because I'd done a bunch of stuff with them, you know, like throughout the bends and was a really support, big supporter of them. And during OK Computer, the tour, 
we were doing getting ready to do an interview for 120 minutes and their filmmaker just said to me he goes hey mind if i put a camera on the on the wall while you guys do this i'm like sure man go ahead and that ended up in the film so which, amazing which is really cool you know yeah oh man i mean okay computer would have been my 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 the other one uh yeah. i mean but in rainbows is cool and i you know i think it's a little different uh it, it kind of reflects again sort of my aesthetic a little bit so yeah, yeah. I love it, like House of Cards. There's so many great songs on there. Now, when the next album that you picked was really cool that you picked this one, <laughs> Poll 3, you know, Poll. And I was talking about the fact that a lot of people may or may not know that this is a German producer, DJ, you know, like the different things that he does. Tell me about this, this record and how you discovered it. You know, it's one of those records that I heard years and years ago, uh, but it was actually during quarantine that i just kind of became obsessed with it and i think it's like the perfect music for quarantine almost nothing is happening <laughs> uh but I, I yeah i feel like this reflects a certain part of my personality which is like i love i love ambient music i love techno i love dub techno um and this kind of captures that like very subtle kind of i don't know i'm always looking for music because i make pop music i'm always looking for music that takes me out of thinking about music in a, a technical way or something and just helps me kind of just become part of it. Um, and it's, that's music I use for when I'm running a lot uh, yeah. or, or, you know, hiking or like just background music or whatever. And I also do love going out dancing. Like I love techno and, and, and house music. Um, so I feel like this one just kind of aesthetically aligns uh, all those kind of different aspects of my personality, which probably aren't represented in a lot of other records. Um, and I, I love that it's, I mean, I don't know. The, the the lore behind this record is it it's literally he had like a bad filter on his like um on 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 some of his studio gear, which makes all the weird cracking and and yeah. and popping sounds. Which and makes, that's which are cool, they give it character. Yeah, it's its own thing. You know, it's one of those things that's like I wouldn't expect people to like uh, especially like fans of mine or something to like listen to this record and really understand it or care about it, but it's definitely something that I, I think I don't know. This is uh, this is it is more likely that I'm listening to poll than it is that I'm listening to like any music with lyrics <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on a right. regular basis. So, that, yeah, that's really interesting. That's cool for your fans to know. Now, I, I love that. So the last record you picked, you know, I thought was great because it does give you a nod to, you know, the kind of music that comes from your area up there. And it's Death Cab for Cutie going back to their second album. We have the facts and we're voting. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. You know, with election time. uh you know, with, with with the election of this year and everything else, I just thought great, great title as well. But this is uh, tell me why this record was one you loved. I know that it, this was a lot of these songs were recorded at their parents' homes, like oh, they yeah. were over like a five month period. They, you know, they were like actually doing a lot of stuff at home. It was really interesting. Chris Walla, Ben, those guys just doing their thing. You know, tell yeah. me, about, love this record. I mean, it it, it was. It's the one that stuck with me the most because it's the one that I started listening to. It was the first record that I really dug into of theirs. And it was like the one that was out when I was like going and seeing them, you know, uh, at the show box at, at every chance I had, you know, and and I was like, a, you know, 16 year old. And it was just like it does that thing of like capturing sort of that melancholy. But he has his like Ben Gibbard's like cool songwriting thing but it's yeah. kind of in its infancy so i i loved it because it's almost like the the lyrics almost feel abstract because they're so specific like you can yeah. you could tell there is a specific story that this is about but he's almost obscuring it by being just so detailed with it and i yeah. love that about that kind of songwriting and it also like i mean you know there's a couple songs where it's like they go as slow as a song can go. <laughs> yeah, yeah just for, I mean, for the effect, it's like unbelievable, right? Yeah, but then also, like, uh, some of them are, like, fun and strange, you know? It's cool lyrical twists, and to me, it's just, like, one of those records that it's nostalgia. I could turn it on at any time, and it makes me, like, you know, tear up a little bit because it's something that connects me with my past. Um, and, and really, like, it reminds me of an era, like, you know, rainy days uh, in October in Seattle, like, listening to this record on my disc man while you know on my way to go see built to spill at the show box you know that yeah. kind of thing uh, that's, a, that's a great great show to go see right oh yeah loud love it <laughs> yeah spill. you know it's funny you know when i met the guys from death camp for the first time we were on a plane leaving seattle i was at a wedding 
And uh, I walked into the plane, and Ben Gibbard goes, hey, Matt, I'm Ben Gibbard from Jeff's Cat for Cutie. And he goes, uh, yeah, he goes, you know, they were fans of 120 minutes. You want to tell me that? And then we ended up, we were sitting across from each other in an aisle. So we were DJing for each other with iPods, sharing music with each Amazing. other. Amazing flight and that's how we ended up meeting each other and eventually i took him record shopping around new york city and we bought stuff for each other which was so cool, cool. like things that like he's like well you don't know this you should hear this and i'm like oh you love this you know like it was really we spent a whole afternoon in new york city when there were a ton of record stores still <laughs> you know what Amazing. i mean so man was, th that's cool yeah no i mean he was just one of my heroes and obviously like the postal service was so influential for me too you know um for obvious reasons like it was it was that record that took the indie pop thing and combined it with like electronic music and even a little bit of like dance flavors in a way that no one else had. And, 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 and that would have been my other like runner up for the, for the list. But it, you know, um, yeah, like I feel like because of that, I've always had this affinity for Ben Gibbard and, you know, I, I think early days of me singing, I was trying to emulate him as well. <laughs> yeah, well no, but, all about that. It's good. It's, it's a good place to start for sure. Right? And Ben's great, man. Yeah, I'm, totally. I'm, I love his music. I love, you know, so they're, it's so cool. You know I mean? Uh, Chris Lee, you know, even Chris, you know, I, I was disappointed. I was sad when Chris left the band, but I'm also think, you know, they're still putting out great songs and, and great music. So, you For know, sure. cause Ben's great too. And his solo stuff is amazing too. So, but anyway, so I got to tell you, Robert, I want to thank you so much for coming by, but I have one, one last question is, You've been how much? How much stuff do you have prepared for in, for your next record already? So your fan. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, depends on who you ask. If you ask me, I have a hundred songs. <laughs> uh, uh, who knows? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it's funny because what gets released of my material is always, you know, um, the stuff that, that 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 feels like Robert Long. But there's definitely like stuff that is very different that's going to be on the next record. I'm really excited to kind of share that. I mean, certainly stuff that's like a lot more, I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot more like almost rock based on some level, but you know, from the lens of, of my like maximalist production thing. Uh, and, and, you know, some of it feels like it could be, you know, alternative rock. Some of it feels like it really could be like a punk song. Some of it feels like it's like, I don't know, like electro or something. Um, so it's really kind of all over the place, the stuff I've been working on. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped to get it out there. And, and like, yeah, I even have like a cool, like dub song, which I'm pumped on. Ooh, I got, so I got nice. really deep into a dub phase during quarantine. I was listening to like scientists and King Tubby every day, you know, <laughs> oh, on real dub. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Real dub. That's great. Old King Tubby stuff is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Robert, listen, I want to thank you so much for, uh, for doing this today. It was great to have you on, you know what I mean? It really was a pleasure. And I hope I run into you in Silver Lake, man, because, you know, I'm all, maybe uh, that or Los Feliz, Fred 62, somewhere around there, like in the neighborhood, anywhere. Sure. There's a lot of great places, Leela Thai, Green Leaves. I'm always like somewhere eating around like Silver Lake. You know what I mean? Love I still, it. Yeah. You know, do you get out to any any of those out, restaurants that are, that are having outdoor food these days? Or? I've been out to like two. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've been kind of. Just staying insular, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I, I definitely am like open to it. I went out to uh, you know Casita del Campo. Anytime I can have yeah. like uh, chips and salsa and margaritas like outside, it's pretty great. Yeah, uh, I was there with a whole group of people like two weeks ago. I love that. Uh, oh, we yeah. were saying just so people watching know we we're yeah. being safe. Hey, Robert, this was great. Thanks for spending time with me today. And uh, once again, I want to let everybody know, uh, Better in College is the latest single. It's great with Ash. And the new album will be coming soon. So, Robert, we'll see you soon, man. Thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been a blast. Yeah, it was really a lot of fun, Robert. You take care, man. We'll speak to you soon. All right. Talk soon. All right. You got it. That's Robert DeLong, everybody. And I just wanted to tell you, uh, you know, go back and check out his whole catalog. He's got a lot of great tracks. Start right with the new one, Better in College, and go all the way back to the beginning with Global Concepts, which is still a phenomenal song. But he's just such a great artist and... Uh, He's always really also incredible to see live. He's, he's just got a great live show. Anyway, this show is in a lonely place. You're never in a lonely place. If you've got music in your soul, in your life, I know that I'm very, very happy to be here with you. And um, I will be back with you next week. I want to thank everybody at Rolling Live Studios. And I want to thank you for watching. Stay safe, stay sane, and I'll be back with you soon. Take care now.